is the Big O Show. This is the Big O Show. And there he is, ready to go, locked and loaded. How you feeling, my man? Doing great. How are you? Oh, much better. Much better. Had a really interesting day yesterday, so uh, we uh, recovered. Anyway, good to so, hear. Good to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, kind of a freaky day yesterday. It was. Uh, it was interesting. Anyway, uh, let's get to it. What'd you think? By the way, what'd you think of the national championship game uh, yesterday? Well, impressive uh, big men for both teams. A lot of length on UConn. That's what I took away. I said, man, this this team can really uh, shut down a three point shooting team with all the length they have. Just well coached. I mean, they're they're a machine right now. I, I remember covering the Final Four when Florida went back to back, and thinking, yeah, we may never see this again. But uh, obviously, college basketball uh, in today's game, you can you can still do it if you get a great coach. Uh, like Dan Hurley, and and you and you have a school that's so committed to basketball, like UConn is, as far as NIL and everything else. Yeah, I mean that's their thing. That's their yeah. that's always been their jam, dude. And, yep. and 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 getting Dan Hurley is getting one of the great great uh, you know college coaches that's out there. I mean that maniac is absolutely awesome. And and by the way, to me, the, a couple things that stood out from the two championship games. Um, both games were exactly the same. Mm-hmm. The deeper and more athletic team yep. won. The team that had the best player lost. Yeah, it was a beautiful example of team game because Edie and Clark were the best players on the court, but they didn't have the best teams, and their teams weren't nearly as athletic, or as deep, or as physical as. Yeah, Edie can be physical. But the entire UConn team can get physical with with Purdue, where the entire South Carolina team could get physical, you know, right. with Iowa. To me, it was like two mirrored games, dude, watching it. It was like the same results because you had the same deficiencies. Correct. And and really, I mean, the kudos to uh, Dan Hurley. I mean, he lost three guys to the NBA last year off of that team that won the national – and basically – I think five of the top eight players or whatever that he had on that team and, and rebuilt it quickly. And part of it is just really good work on the transfer portal. That's a guy who knows his roster, knew exactly what he needed, went out and got the pieces he needed and, and uh, just paired them up with what he had coming back. And, and uh, so look, man, uh, college basketball. Diara off the bench had nine points. Yep. Edie only had the Smith kid score 12 outside of that. Their bench guy outscored everybody else on that team. He just didn't have enough support, dude. Well, Frank okay. Martin, uh, who, who, of course, from Miami high days, as we know, and he's been coaching in college for so long, obviously at South Carolina, I think he's at UMass now. Uh, our buddy Frank Martin said on Twitter last night that the key to this matchup is going to be UConn's length getting out to cover Purdue shooters. Purdue was one of the best three-point shooting teams in all of college basketball. I think they only took seven threes last night because UConn just denied them what they could do. And so, and all of that is size and athleticism and, and, and uh, length on the perimeter to, to be yep. able to disrupt uh, that passing game and, and not allow them to do what they wanted. So uh, again, just a great coach, great system, and he knows exactly how to use the portal and that's what it takes to win. And South Carolina was the same exact yep. thing, dude. They were too strong, too athletic, too deep. And Iowa just had the best player, period. And by the way, her passing, Caitlin's oh, yeah. passing is as elite as it gets, dude. I mean, let me tell you something. If her players were better at finishing, because they left a lot. Of, I watched that tournament. They left a lot of her passes, you know, incomplete, dude. And she set you up beautifully that you should have finished the damn play. If it's not for the... um the girl with the two fuzzy, um, what's yes. her name? Uh, Stolke? Haley. Yeah, oh, Stolke. Stolke or, yeah. She was the only one that really was kind of more clutch for her and came through when she did pass to her. But so many of her teammates, man, her passing, holy shit, for the next level, that's going to be fun to watch because she'll be passing to people that are much more skilled. Yeah. So they won't go to waste nearly as much. It's, it's the one shot that I have to take at Iowa that they left a lot of, easy points on the floor during that tournament 
Yeah, to me, it's I watch her and I just think of Steph Curry, like when yeah. Steph was at his MVP peak, like just being able to do it on both, you know, passing and scoring from anywhere on the court. Like that's that's who she is in, in terms of yeah. her game. So yeah. she isn't uh, a yeah. stud or anything like that, but but uh, but her offensive skills, holy shit, dude! Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really not, not very many people can see the court the way she sees the court. That's uh, that's super impressive. And Edie. Brother, it only took like 50 years for somebody to figure out how to throw a hook. Yeah, right? It only took that long. Like right <laughs> right now, Pat Riley, Pat Riley must be so sexually aroused the last few weeks. Like, I got to do anything to draft this guy. Because, you know, Pat Riley, that's his guy. Right. That's his kind of player, bro. That, Seven footers, that's what he wants. Dominant, it, it, dominant big win. Side out, yeah. You know, suppose like no, no, I don't want any of that shit. But you know, but if it was Pat Riley, he's like, yeah, that'd be his hey, first pick. That guy right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take some. I'll take a, I'll, my fat ass goes with the ice cream. He goes with the player. You know. So. Yeah, exactly. By the way, <laughs> Edie ice cream is pretty good. I gotta say, I gotta give Edie ice cream a little props there. But yeah, I don't know how people have not learned the hook. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's still effective, especially in college. I mean, uh, there's just not a lot of size. Everybody wants to put five shooters out there. So, uh, you know, kudos to uh, to Matt wait, Painter wait. for getting that, that guy on that team. Okay, but he's not Kevin Willis. He's right. Not a, he's not a black hole. Right. Like, he used to pass it into Kevin Willis. That shit never came out. Right. We'll pass it out to his shooters, dude. So he's so you know he 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 under he he goes. No, with he this. knows how to play the game. He knows how to play yeah. the game in the post. There, yeah. there's no doubt. There's there, there's there's there has to be some intelligence to play that position. It's not just get the ball and turn and shoot. Yeah, right. To, you have right. to play it. Yeah, he's not Mister Hog, and that's right. what I love about him that he's able to pass out. Now I'm interested to see who drafts him and how they incorporate him, and and does he start to influence? bringing back a little bit more because dude the, the the art of playing with your back to the basket that shit has disappeared bro yep five that's shooters it. blame blame spolstra the day put lebron at the five i mean yeah. that's really yeah. that's really what it comes down to but but it's interesting to have a traditional center like that who has really good footwork overall mm -hmm. and you're like okay now will this influence the game to go a little bit more back to that sense Right. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Be but interesting to watch, but uh, those guys are hard to, to, to come by though. I think that's that's the issue is just so many so many big men now. You go to these AAU tournaments, they're just all sitting at the three-point line. They don't want to go into the into the post and play that. They just think that their future is relying on the three-point shot and and so uh kudos to Edie for developing that part of his game and and staying with it and being unique. He's a unicorn now. It's kind of the frustrating part about Bam because right. He's never dominated either. He's never really been a great post player. And he's certainly not a great three-point shooter, although he's improved, but he doesn't really take enough to really, you know, it's not the volume that you can actually measure him by. But overall, that's kind of the frustrating that he's kind of been a tweener in that sense. Mm -hmm. and this guy's going to come in into the league right away, and he's going to give people trouble. Because right. if you have shooters... Yep. Kind of reminds me a little bit of what Orlando did years ago with Dwight with, Howard. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would say the one thing with Bam, uh, he has improved the jump shot. That was not existed the first several years in the NBA, yes. and and now he's, he's actually got it. He's actually got a shot he can make consistently. So yeah, kind of like UD when UD was. Yeah, in what prime. I mean is he doesn't like go all out on the three, and right. he's really not a great post player either. Mm hmm. You know, it's the funny part. It's as good as he is, he really never tried to – he hasn't really tried to dominate inside or outside. You know what I mean? It's right. it's, it's just kind of weird. And it's I a say, Draymond Green mentality. He doesn't want to score, bro. Yeah, yeah. He just uh, doesn't – he wants yeah. to set screens. He wants to play defense. He wants to pass. He's the Scoring is the last thing on, Brain, on Bam's mind. That's why I call him a super role player, and I can't call yeah. him a star or franchise player. I can't do that. He's like a – he's actually what Bosch – was forced to do. Mm -hmm. That's him. He, yeah. he excels at being the number. Like he would be the greatest number three of of this franchise history if because he embraces that shit. Yeah, being Absolutely. that third wheel, not the first and second that you have to like carry the load every single night. Meanwhile, Bosch is dying to be one or two. He's <laughs> just right. happy being three. It's 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 just an odd thing. All right, what's the latest in recruiting uh, with the Canes this week? 
Well, they picked up a commitment. They're sixth of the 2025 cycle from a tight end out of Ohio. Luca Gilbert is his name. He's 6'7", about 240 pounds. Uh, only caught 15 passes. So when you look at his production, you're like, wow, that's not a whole lot of production. But everybody in the country wanted him. Ohio State, Michigan, a lot of the Big Ten schools were interested in him. Uh, good athleticism. And, you know, Miami's uh, – the tight end they just signed in this last class, Elijah Lofton, the kid out of Bishop Gorman, I wrote about this for The Athletic uh, a week ago when I did my spring observations. I think he's going to be a running back. I think, you know, he's kind of was undersized. He was about 6'2", 230, 240. And I think they're, they're, they're sort of transitioning him to running back now. And he's a guy that, that you can see lining up, catching a lot of balls out of the backfield, getting a few carries, kind of like C.J. Donaldson, who uh, if you watch uh, Big 12 football over at West Virginia, uh, Donaldson's a kid that came out of Miami and, and went to West Virginia and, and went from tight end prospect to running back and is just really really good and so uh you know i think for miami the tight end position is important you think about elijah royal not being able to stay healthy for the last two years uh ninth year cam mccormick you know those those were your options that's why the tight end position took such a a steep drop because of the injuries to royal and and having to play guys like riley williams who's a true freshman not ready to block and do all the things that was asked of him so i think uh i think tight end is an important position in this recruiting class for miami and uh, they're looking for a guy who could potentially come in and be a, a true number one down the road because I think Lofton is probably headed to being in the backfield. All right. I'm just going to keep thinking, my name is Luca. I live on the second floor. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> That's just kind of what comes to my mind when you say Luca. Anyway, what are you working on in the athletics so folks can check you out? Yeah, we just came out with our all-state team for Georgia. We did Florida about a week ago. So this is like an ongoing series that we keep doing where we kind of look at the modern recruiting era. You got Cam Newton on that list there. Cam Newton ahead of, uh, yeah, Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence, who are obviously really good quarterbacks to come out of the state of Georgia. So Video came out over the weekend of Cam, like he was at some place and some resort or somewhere or something. And there were a bunch of some kids playing football, and he just got out there and started throwing the football with the kid. I thought that was really cool because right. Well, he's know, got us. He's got his seven on seven team, and everybody knows yeah, he got into that huge fight with like just out of the yeah. blue where he was at, and he just like because he's dressed. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Of course, he started throwing football to people to, to those kids, and yeah. I'm thinking, my God, those four or five kids must be on freaking cloud, cloud nine right now that an NFL quarterback is throwing them the ball. So that was good job by Cam. I, I like that. Absolutely. That, you know, so uh, so uh, that piece and uh, what's next? What else are you working on? Yeah, we're going to do uh, kind of already written it. Uh, Max Olson, who works with me at The Athletic, one of our national reporters, he knows Cam Ward really, really well because, he, okay. first of all, Max lives out in Texas. Cam's from Texas, knows his dad, knows the whole situation, went out and wrote a big story about him um, when he was at Incarnate Ward before he transferred to Washington State. So we got a lot of, like, details and and you know as far as when, when cam decided to first announce he was turning pro and then decide to come back to school um and play at miami and transfer to miami so we have a story sort of outlining that and, and his impact at miami i think he's cam is finally going to talk to reporters on thursday at the university of miami so we're trying to line up we've got our story written we're just kind of waiting for cam to talk uh so that we can add uh, whatever perspective he wants to add on thursday to uh, his time at miami but uh, there'll be a cam ward feature uh, there'll be some more recruiting stuff i'm kind of trying to do a big picture story on on miami's 2025 class and what they're kind of looking at so there'll be there'll be plenty of stuff to read in the athletic and of course the podcast uh you know our listeners can go and check it out whenever they whenever they're not watching you oh they can come listen to my podcast there you go there you go appreciate it as always follow them on twitter at manny underscore navarro make sure you subscribe to the athletic and go to canes where we'll be there broadcasting tomorrow live and remember use our code big o10 you will get 10 percent off if you go in person or online and online if you order over 99 dollars, you will get free shipping at caneswear.com manny as always thank you my brother we'll catch up later in the week thank you brother talk soon you got it there you go manny navarro and our caneswear miami hurricanes report This is the Big O Show!